Thanksgiving. So we're going to be in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. I have been teaching on the Holy Spirit in the, for, over the past several Sundays. I'm going to take a break from that today to talk about this today. And so if you would turn there, we're going to read all of the verses, the whole chapter. The whole chapter. By the way, regarding inviting people, one more thing that I must say. Um, we, last Sunday, we had um, Spanish translation, and we would have had it also today. So if you know anybody who speaks Spanish, you are welcome to um, invite them and let them know that we do have um, translation available. At least sometimes we do. Yeah, 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 that, that is good to know. So when you go out and evangelize, um, and tell people about the church, you can let them know that. And we're praying we get someone who can do a tra translation in Portuguese as well. I met so many people who speak Portuguese around here um, who'd like to come to church, but they just, they, they, they will need translation. So um, God is going to provide that at some point. Okay. Um, Joshua chapter 2 from verse 1. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch, them. You may catch up with them. But she had take, taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalk of flask she had laid out on the floor, on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan, and as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord had given this land to you and that a great fear of you had fallen on us so that all those who live in the country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for, for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorite east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your life, the men assured her, if you don't tell what we're doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Now she had said to them, go to the hills so the pursuer will not find you. Hide yourself there three days until they return, and then go on your way. The men said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us 
unless when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house, if anyone goes outside your house into the street, this blood will be on his own head. We will not be responsible for, as, for any, as for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But, you will, but if you tell what we're doing, we will be released from the oath you made to us. Agreed, she replied, let it be as you say. So she went away, so she, sent, so she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went out, they went down out of the hills forded the river and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, the Lord had surely given the whole land in our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. We're going to start there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you so much, God, for just your goodness to us, Lord. Thank you for this day and the fact that we can gather here, Lord, really as a spiritual family, as a people, Lord, bound together by the love of Jesus. Thank you, our Father. Lord, we ask you in the name of Jesus that you will bless us, you will bless everyone who has come on this super hot morning to come here and to listen to your word. Father, thank you. Lord, I pray that your word, Lord, would just bring joy and peace to our hearts, Lord. Father, we pray that your word, Lord, would just bring a fresh assurance of our salvation to all of us and a new hope of salvation for anyone who is not saved here or who may watch this later online. Father, we pray, Lord, that you will reveal Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, only you can reveal Christ. We ask that you will reveal him to us today in a fresh way in Jesus' name. Amen. What a story. Um, that a whole chapter in the Bible is devoted to. I have been encouraging everyone here to read the Bible. I can't say it enough. Please take the word of God and read it for yourself. You know, I was really tempted for this Sunday, for today, instead of teaching this. I was thinking yesterday, you know what, maybe I, I should just come here and try to help people with how to read the Bible, how to understand it, how to meditate on it. And God willing, maybe in a couple of weeks, I may do that. Because, I said that because the truth is that I can come here and preach messages and God can anoint them, but the truth is what is really going to make you grow spiritually, which is what I want to happen to you, is the time alone with you and God. It's really the time alone with you and God, reading the word, praying. That is what is going to turn you into a spiritual giant, and that's what I desire for you. And... Um, I, so I really want to encourage you to read your, the word. If you don't know where to start, hey, start with the Gospel of Mark. It's the shortest of the gospel. Just read it. Um, read Every day, read a chapter. It will take you two weeks, and your life will change. Um, you, you read it. You meditate on it. But God willing, one of these Sundays, we'll, we will do that. But whenever you're reading the Bible and you see a story to which so much volume is dedicated... You see a story where, okay, they sent out spies to it, and, and, and then there's so much volume that's dedicated to it, it means there is something to really pause and think about. It means God wants us to pause and think about, and for months, for months, I've been thinking about this story, and just um, the lessons that are 
in here and that we can really learn from. So here's what happened. Here's the context. Okay. God called a man named Abraham and he gave him a promise. He told him that I'm going from you. I'm going to start a whole new nation, a whole new people. And the man had no children. So eventually God gave him one child whose name is Isaac. And only one child, but over several years, hundreds of years, 400 years about, uh, they turned into a whole nation of about 2 million people. But they were slaves in Egypt. God told Abraham, I'm going to start a brand new people with you and I am going to give them a land. And God told Abraham what that land would be. It's the land of Israel. And so they came out of Egypt by miracle of God, out of slavery that they were under there for several years, for 400 years or so. God got them out, and they walked, they journeyed through a desert, and they arrived at the edge of the promised land. And when they arrived at the edge of the promised land, they were on the other side, they, were, they arrived at the Jordan River, and on the other side of the Jordan River was this city named Jericho. It was the first place that they were going to conquer. Now, you read later that this city of Jericho was so wicked, God wanted to completely destroy it. He wanted nothing left of Jericho. They weren't even um, supposed to rebuild it. It's not like it was a city that they were going to occupy. God wanted them to completely get rid of Jericho. Now you say, why? That sounds kind of bad. That may trouble some of you or someone watching. God, at some point in this city state named Jericho, as happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, the place when the place became so wicked, where the wickedness was so much, that God Almighty had to react to it by getting rid of them. And so it happened in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, that's in Genesis chapter 18. In that case, God sent um, a judgment by fire. And for those of you who, who, may, who um, may have some doubts about whether that's just um, fairy tale, somebody decided to do research and go find the site of Sodom and Gomorrah based on the description of the Bible. About 3,500 years ago, a major metro, uh, metropolitan area, very wealthy. They pinpointed from scripture where that place would be. And they found it. It was a, a, few res, uh, a research group from a university. They found it. And they discovered that the whole place was destroyed by what they described as a high heat event. They found the whole place was destroyed it dates to 3,500 years ago, the time when Abraham would have been living. And they found that everything that was there that was metal was melted. So they ruled out an earthquake because they did not see any um, evidence of walls cracking or collapsing. They ruled out a volcano because they did not see evidence of lava. They ruled out... Um, uh, a, a fire, like just a fire broke out, like broke out in Chicago years ago. It, they ruled that out because there is no pattern of a fire spreading. But what they found, the whole city intact, the only thing was just anything that could burn was burnt up. And they say it wasn't just, it, it was a high heat event, meaning it got so hot, thousands of Fahrenheit, that everything, swords, spears, uh, Everything that was metal was just found melted. It tells you the Bible is true. 
Um, it's the one book that the more we do research, the more we found that it is true. Now, the same thing happened in that case. God decided to use fire. But in this case here, God decided to send the people of Israel, Joshua, to go there and execute the judgment of God over Jericho. And the, that is the justice of God. Later on, when the people of Israel went into that land and they began to do the same evil things that the people of Jericho did, sacrificing their children to gods, um, killings, um, abominable idolatry. At some point, when the people of Israel began to do the same thing, God also sent people, the Babylonian, to come and do the same thing, destroy the whole place. God is no respecter of persons. So here was Jericho at the brink of the judgment of God, at the brink of destruction. And you remember, God said to Abraham in Sodom that if, if I find just 10 righteous people, I will not destroy the place. It means God couldn't find even 10 righteous people. The place had gotten so bad. So here in Jericho also, it had become so bad, it was irredeemable. So judgment was coming there. You often hear people say, you know, this tragedy happened. How could that happen? How, why could these uh, good people, what could such a terrible thing happen to them? Well, the real question is, why wasn't everybody? Why did God show even mercy? Because the truth is, it's not just Sodom. It's not just Jericho. It is all of us who deserve the judgment of God. All of us. You're saying, well, I'm a good person. Well, you're a good person because you're comparing yourself to other sinners or comparing themselves to other sinners. But if you compare yourself to the standards of God, who is Jesus Christ, all of us, me, you, everybody, we've all sinned enough to be sent to hell. So, in this city, though, is one woman. She's not the most moral person in the city. This is a wicked city, and she is the renowned prostitute of the town. That's not a good reputation to have. That's not a good, um, that, that's, not a, that's not a good background. She's a sinner. She, this is what she was known for. Not known for philanthropy, not known for... Um, being righteous, she was known as the prostitute. So much so that when they suspected that spies had come into the land, the people knew, yeah, they must be staying with Rahab, the prostitute. But here's the amazing thing. This prostitute, this woman, as bad as she was, a sinner that had a reputation for it. She showed something that is amazing. So the first lesson we learn here is that the judgment of God is coming. Not just as it was on, on, on Sodom and on Jericho, but the judgment of God is coming upon the whole earth because of sin. Second, but God, in his mercy, God in his goodness is always looking for a reason to spare people from the judgment that is to come. God loves people. He does not want, whenever God knows that there is a chance there will be repentance, whenever God knows that there is a chance that people may change, when God knows that there is a chance that there's any reason given to him to spare judgment, God will take that reason. And will spare. And so here is this woman. And you know what this woman demonstrated? She says this to the, to the spies. I know that the Lord has given this land to you. 
and that, the, and that a great fear has fallen on all of us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard of how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to your enemies, to those two kings and of the Amorite on the other side of the Jordan whom you completely destroyed. She as terrible as she was, a prostitute, she had something that all of us have. She had a conscience. She had something in her that tells her, this is right, this is wrong. All of us have that. Doesn't matter the culture we're born in, where we're born in, where we grew up, all human beings from all culture, there is something that God puts in us that's called a conscience. The ability to know what God has said as right and wrong. And everyone in the world has that. People know when they are sinning. And they know when they're being rebellious against the Lord. And they also know, here's the other thing, people also know when God Almighty, their creator, is speaking to them. This woman had heard, and from her testimony, it is clear, everyone else in Jericho had heard about the Lord. Now, how did they hear this? There was no evangelist. God did not send a prophet to Jericho. But God, in his love and in his mercy, somehow he had made sure that whatever he did in Egypt in getting these people of Israel out of there, God had made sure that the word had spread throughout that entire world in those days and that people had heard that there is this God in Israel. There is no idol or shape or form. He is the real God and you stand no chance against him. Your gods are all fake. The God of Israel is the true God. Everybody in that world in those days heard about that. But you know what they all chose to do? Resist him. Jericho is a picture of that place that resists God even after they have heard of how great and awesome and true and real God is. Some pe people ask me sometimes, well, what's going to happen to people in this part of the world or this part of the world where they haven't heard the gospel? What's going to happen to people in this, in this place who haven't heard about God? Let me tell you this. Everybody gets a chance to hear about God. I believe that. Everybody, it doesn't matter, you name me in the country, it doesn't matter. People say, often will point out Iran. Let me tell you, there are Christians in Iran. There are Christians in Saudi Arabia. There are Christians in China. There's probably more Christians in China than in any other country in the world. You wouldn't know that, but that's the truth. Um, no, I won't say this here because we're, we're recording. There's... There are Christians in China. There are Christians everywhere. There are Christians everywhere. People hear about the gospel. People hear about Jesus. They may not hear as much as you and I have heard. But they hear. God allows me. And if God doesn't send a friend, a neighbor, God will send a dream, he will send, give a vision, whatever way he chooses, everyone gets to hear in some shape, way, or form about God. Rahab is the proof of that. Before there was a single Israelite who made it to the promised land, she had heard about the God of Israel. Not only did she hear about it, everyone else in Jericho had heard about it. But only one person took that word seriously enough to say, you know what? I want to be a part of this thing that God is doing with the people of Israel. This woman took the word of God seriously. Whereas the rest of the population was like, you know what? We're going to fight. We're going to resist him. But this woman... And she showed a tremendous sense of taking the God of Israel seriously. 
She didn't have a pastor. She didn't have a church. She didn't have a Bible. But she had a conscience, and she responded to that conscience. Let me pause here to say this. In what ways has God tried to show you that he is real? And for those, anybody watching out there, how many ways in which God has tried to show you that he is real? That there is no God, there's no other God, and that he is real. I know God, God maybe sent a friend, a parent, or God did a miracle in your family that you know it was God. Maybe God, you, you were supposed to be dead and something happened that was clearly an act of God to rescue your life. Maybe it is that God spoke to you. Maybe in some, I don't know, but in some way, shape or form, God has been trying to get your attention and to let you know, hey, I'm here and I am real. I'm here and I am real. So what happens, this woman not only shows um, a tremendous sense of taking God's word seriously, she not only shows a conscience that was active and honesty in knowing that she knew about the Lord and everybody else did, but she also showed something else. A humble plea for mercy. She said to these people, spare my life. She somehow knew, we don't know, this is mind-blowing, is that it, she somehow knew that the character of the God of Israel is that if someone, even a prostitute, asked for mercy, he will give it. And so she asked, she said, spare my life. Don't kill me. I, and these people didn't tell her, yeah, well, too bad. You know, we, we're, not, we're, we're, not, we're not sparing you. We're on a destroy everybody mission. No, she said, she asked them, spare me. Promise me that you will not hurt me. And, and she, you see, she, so she, tell, she told them, swear to me by the Lord. They, she somehow knew that Somehow also when a promise is made in the name of the Lord, it's not going to be broken, they will keep it. It is amazing. And she pleaded with them. She said, listen, I'm a part of these people. I deserve to be destroyed as well. But I want you to promise me that you will not do that to me. And these people promised her that they would not. And here's what they told her. Not only her, but he also mentions her family. You will notice here that um, one of the things that there are some, some, cause, there are some people in the year who tried to make an argument that, well, she wasn't really a, a, a prostitute. Well, she was. Um, you can see here when she says the people to spare, she does not mention husband or children. She say, my father, my mother, my brothers, and my, my, my siblings. She would have mentioned my husband and my children if, if that was the case. No, she did, this was, and um, some tradition says she was 40 years old at this point. And so she had been doing this for a very long time. So, but she pleaded with them, please spare me and spare my family. Today, no matter what you've done, where you've been, what your past is like, if you would plead for mercy from God, God will show you mercy. There has to come a point where every person, there has to come a point in your life where you realize, you know what, I'm a sinner and I need the mercy of God. That is the gospel. There has to come a point in your life when you realize, I need the mercy of God. I'm no better than the other people in my town. 
And I need the mercy to be spared from the judgment that is to come. And where you humbly ask. You don't demand, but you, um, you humbly ask God, God, would you spare me from the judgment that is to come? Would you spare me from hell? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And that death is not death in this world. Only it is eternal separation from God in hell. As we've been learning at evangelism training. It is eternal separation from God in hell. There has to come a point in the life of a person where you say, show me mercy. Show me mercy and spare me from the judgment. And here is what the, these people told her. Um, take a cord, a scarlet cord, and put it by your window. The other thing I will mention is that when the Bible gives details like this, what the color of the cord was, there is a meaning to it. Why a scarlet cord? It is a representation that forgiveness comes through blood. It is a representation in the Old Testament that forgiveness of sin, you and I don't just go to God and say, forgive me, and God says, sure, I'll forgive you. It is one of the great truths in the Bible that even God, God Almighty, cannot just say to you and me, yes, I forgive you, your sin is gone. There has to be blood that is shed so that sin can be forgiven. It says in Leviticus, it is a ransom for life. The blood is the ransom for sin. And this was a picture that were given in the Old Testament as many other pictures or types or foreshadows. I don't like to use the word types because people don't understand that in our, in our days here. But it is a foreshadowing like a representation of Jesus Christ, who ultimately would come, would die on the cross, and his blood would be what provides a way for everyone to be saved. And here's what she, they told her. Put this cord by your window so that when we come in and attack the city, anybody who is under this house here with the window with this scarlet cord, anyone who is in this house here will be spared. Get your relative, get whoever you love, whoever you care about, let them come under the cover of this scarlet cord here and they will be spared. So today, anybody who comes under the cover of the blood of Jesus Christ, anybody who comes and runs from the judgment under the cover of the, of the blood of Jesus is spared from the judgment of God. And anyone else who is outside of it is judged. Now that's just the truth of the word of God. You say, well, no, why is it that there's only one way? Why does it only have to be the blood of Jesus Christ? Because he is the only one who came and lived without sin. Because of that, he can save people by his death on the cross. We can't take any other human being because all human beings have sinned. I could not have gone on that cross. I wouldn't be able to save myself. Neither would you be able to go there. You wouldn't be able to save yourself, your children. You have to come to a point where you realize it's only by the blood of Jesus Christ that you and I can be saved. That is the gospel. That is what we proclaim here. It, you can do penance. There is no purgatory. You can buy your way out of it. doesn't matter the richest men in the world. They can't buy their way into heaven. There's no amount of money. It has to be the son of God who went to the cross and he died. I was saying this to someone. People say, well, there are many ways. You know, Jesus wished there were many ways. Before that night that he was, supposed, that he was arrested, he went to the garden and he prayed Father, if there is a way to do this another way, let's do it the other way so that I will not have to suffer this to, to take this cup. Jesus was looking for another way. He was asking the Father, can we not do this another way? Is there not any other way that we can save people? Do I really have to go to the cross and be separated from you? And the Father said, no, there's no other way. 
If there was another way, Jesus wouldn't have gone to the cross and died. And today, you and I have to make a choice. Are we going to be like those people in Jericho who bunkered in and, and say, yeah, we're going to fight to the end? Or are we going to be like Rahab who say, you know what, I deserve judgment, but please, would you spare me because you're a good God and I'm going to do whatever. When they told her, put this scarlet cord, she didn't say, wait, why? Why a scarlet cord? I want a green one. Or I, so she, she accepted what they told her. That this is the way salvation is going to occur. Anybody who comes under the cover of the blood will be saved, will be rescued. And so that's what happens. And what a, um, sorry, I want to, I know this is a, by the way, I recommend you when you come to our church and you listen to the messages, please have, take notes, uh, which Janet always does, by the way, um, or go listen to this afterwards because I tend not to give three-point sermons. You know, someone, someone said, uh, said, I asked someone one time, like, um, because I heard pastors do, they do introduction, three points, and a conclusion. So I, I asked um, so, someone, like, you know, uh, it was actually Anna, I asked her, do I give three-point sermon? She resoundingly said, no, you don't. <laughs> because the, it, it, if I have to do three points, I will need to live for 400 years to teach everything that there is to teach. If every Sunday I just do three points, I can't do that. Please take note, if you find it to be too many points, go home and, start, uh, go home and, 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 stu and, and study it. But I do want to mention some he here that is amazing. What a change in one generation. Because there was a time when Moses had sent spies in the land. Those spies came back and said, we cannot take this land. We cannot take this land. This is, and that cost them 40 years. Thank God the next generation went in, Joshua sent in spies, those spies came back, and they said, God has given us the land, let's go get it. It was a generation that believed God and that had faith. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. And so, this woman, not only, this woman, Rahab, she is spared. Later on, you see it's an amazing story. It goes on to chapter 3 and 4. Um, and five and six, it's in chapter six that you see the fall of Jericho. You know how that happened? God miraculously caused that wall to collapse. So if you were to go to Jericho after this, you would see an entire wall that collapsed. But here is the thing that you probably have never heard before, even if you grew up in church. There was a section of that wall that did not collapse. You know what section that was? Rahab's house, because the Bible says her house was in the wall. That's why she had a window. In those days, they would build those city walls so thick, yeah, you could drive chariots on top of them. And she, her house was somehow built in and built off the wall. So when they circled around and God miraculously caused that wall to collapse, showing that it was a judgment of God, just as it was on Sodom and Gomorrah, there was one part of that wall that did not collapse and that was intact. That was Rahab's house with the scarlet cord hanging out the window. And the people knew that is the mercy of Almighty God. It is the mercy of God. He spared her and everyone who was in that house. Can you imagine being in that house? And hearing the rumble and the sound of the wall crashing all around the city. But then your one house was there standing, the one section in the wall. Amazing. God will spare us from the judgment that is to come if we come under the cover of the blood of Jesus. But here is, as I close here, please listen. This is so important. I'm just going to mention a few things here that are, that are amazing and that are good for us to learn today. You say, well, pray that's all I have to do, believe that Jesus died on the cross and humble myself and then that's it and then I will be saved. So some, so 
I can just go there, I can just go and live however I want, and then, um, and then I, I, I will be saved. All I need to do is to believe in Jesus. Now, that deception exists yes, all over the world. Churches are under seduction and deception all over the world. People believe. All they need to do is just, I believe in Jesus. He died on the cross for me. Check. I believe he rose again from the dead. Check. And I believe he's coming again. Check. And I believe his blood covers for my sins. Check. And so I'm saved and now I'm on my way to heaven and I can live however I want. But it's not true. Are we saved by faith alone? Yes, we are. But how do you know that someone has true faith? How do you know that someone has true faith? That faith bears fruit. That faith is evidenced by action. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is knowing that something is true and therefore you act consistently with what you believe. Faith is believing something enough to act on it. You see, I'll, this is my favorite e e illustration of faith. If I walk in this room and the room was dark, I have faith that if I turn on that light switch, the light will come on. How do you know that I believe that? Because I will go and turn it on. That shows that I have faith that that thing works. If I believe that I have, if I say, yeah, I believe, I believe that the, the, the light can turn on, but you say, but why are you staying in a room that's dark then? Well, you know, it's dark, but I want it to be light, but, and I believe the switch worked, but then why don't you go and turn it on? If someone talks like that, soon enough, you, you'll know that, no, they don't really believe. Because if they believe, they, are, they will act according to what they say they believe. And so, true faith, true faith in God is always accompanied by action. Faith without works is dead. Looks like faith, but it's dead. It's like a human being who's dead. Looks like a human being, but the most important thing that makes a human being a human being is not there. The life is gone. So in the same way, faith without works is dead. When there is genuine faith, it will be accompanied by works. So in not, only are we, not only do we need to trust and believe in the blood of Jesus, but there has to be what the Bible calls repentance. Rahab repented. You know how, what her repentance looked like? She joined the people of Israel. She joined the people of Israel, was no longer an idol worshiper, was no longer someone who resisted God. She, she switched sides completely, became a part of the people of God, and she met a gentleman from the tribe of Judah named Salmon. What were you going to say? Oh, you okay. She met a man by the name of Salmon, they got married. She stopped. She quit being, being a prostitute. She, she, she got married. Prostitution was forbidden in Israel, but not, not only that, she got married, and Solomon and Rahab had a son, an amazing man, outstanding man, whose name is Boaz. Rahab, the prostitute, raised Boaz. Have you ever, you've got to stop and think about that. <laughs> the kind of man that this woman raised and the kind of man that he, she produced, an outstanding man of great character. And then Boaz, her son, met a lady named Ruth. They got married and they had a son whose name was Obed. Obed met a lady and they had a child whose name is Jesse. Jesse met a lady, met a lady and he had a son whose name is David the king. Rahab is David's great, 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 great grandmother. Amazing. 
And she gets the distinction, Rahab, of being, not a lot of people are mentioned in more than one book of the Bible. But you know how many books Rahab is mentioned in in the Bible? Take a guess. What? Three? Fifteen, no. Who knows? Rahab is mentioned in five different books of the Bible. Um, she is mentioned pretty much. She is, referred, she is referred to in one way or another in five books of the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So what ended up happening is, you know where she, meant she figures in the New Testament? In the genealogy of Jesus Christ. David is not her most famous grandchild, Jesus Christ, is her most famous great, 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 great grandchild. She is a great, 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 I don't know how many great grandmother of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And here's what the Bible says. Um, in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. She's only one of a few women who are mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. They made sure they highlighted her. Because... Now, people often mention that, you know, it is because of, to say that, well, look, there can be bad people in, in Jesus' genealogy. I say, no, it's the other way. They want to highlight that anyone who repented and had faith could become a part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. They, they, so they mention, it all goes, man, 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 this was a father, this is a father. Oh, by the way, here was the mother. <laughs> In a few places they do that. Matthew does that. And Rahab is one of those. And that's homework. Uh, he just asked who, is the, who are the other one. You have to, you, you have to go read it at, at, at home, um, Stephen. And then she is mentioned. She is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. The Bible says, By faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spy, was not killed with those who were disobedient. By faith. She had to believe that God is going to win this battle in the end. Can you imagine if the people of Israel went to fight and then they lost and they found out that Rahab had helped these people, she'd be dead. She believed that in the end, God would win the battle and she had to be on his side. And then he mentions her in James. James mentions her. In chapter 2, verse 25, in the same way was not even Rahab the, con the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spy and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Rahab is a proof, a demonstration, an example of great faith. We'll meet her in heaven. She's a woman of God. 
Her story is proof. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you have done. If at some point in your life you do two things, put your faith in Jesus Christ and repent, God has a great future for you. It does not matter what you've done, where you've been, what your life has looked like. If you would put your faith in Jesus Christ, that scarlet cord, come under the blood of Jesus Christ and repent. God has a great future for your life. You can become an example of faith for your generation. You can become you, you can be used by God in your life, in your family, and Look at the blessing. It is because of her that the rest of her family was spared from being killed. You know the Bible said, believe in the Lord Jesus, you will be saved, you and your whole family. If you would be the first person to let God enter your family, through you, God will touch others in your family. If you want to, God can enter your family and he can begin to change people and save them. You see, today, the issue is not, we're not trying to be saved from being destroyed uh, by Joshua and, and these people. In the New Testament, God does not, Christians don't fight, um, we, don't, we don't have any human enemies, we fight the devil. And so we don't go around conquering lands and like some people tried to do a thousand years ago in the name of Jesus Christ, that's terrible. Um, it, we, we don't do that. What we do, we fight in the spiritual. And the danger today, the judgment that is coming to the world is not physical destruction. The danger is hell forever. But God wants you and me to turn to him and to show faith, genuine faith, that believes God, comes under the cover of the blood of Jesus and faith that is shown by a different way of life. Let's stand. This is a message of the gospel today. Believe, repent, you will be saved and God will do something new with your life. No matter where you've been, God will do something great and something new with your life. If you have never given your life to Jesus, if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, whether you're here right now or you're watching this now or later, would you humble yourself? Would you say in your heart, I want to stand next to Rahab. I want to humble myself and plead for mercy. Would you, would you not humble yourself and do that? If you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, let today be a new day. Oh, what a great new day that is in the life of a person. When we humble ourselves and we say, Jesus, I need you to forgive me. I need you to forgive me. I am a sinner. I deserve judgment. But may your blood cleanse me and give me a brand new future. I want to be part of what you are doing. In this generation, I want to be part of your kingdom. If that's you, I want you to just pray and repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I deserve judgment. I'm no better than Rahab. But I ask you for your mercy. Forgive my sins. Cleanse me by your blood. 
Make me a new person. Give me a new beginning. Help me to walk with you in repentance. I turn away from my sins. I say no to sin and to Satan. I say yes to Jesus Christ. I want to follow you from now on. Help me to follow you every day. Amen. Father, I pray, God, for everyone who's prayed that and for anyone who's pray, who will be praying that, watching this online. Father, I pray that you will do a new work in their hearts, Lord. God, birth new life. Father, we ask you to do that in the name of Jesus.